course of time So many still reach out to him With broken hearts and minds And every one of them will say Without exception that they find That Jesus never failed Even in the days of old He brought his people through And then he came to show his love And died for me and you And then he rose again to prove That every story had been true That Jesus never fails Jesus never fails Jesus never fails You might as well get thee behind me, Satan You cannot prevail Because Jesus never at times this life brings struggles I find so hard to bear I know I could not make it without Jesus being there it's so encouraging to What can I do to prove to you? Tell me, how can you deny? No one told facts, no mysteries. It's all so cut and dry. And all oh, the witness stand of your life, I'll be the first to testify that my I'm glad. I'm so glad. I'm glad he never failed. He's never failed me. And I'm thankful for it. Nathaniel's here with me. Nathaniel grew up in Crossroads Baptist Church, born his family, born and raised in our church. Sings in our choir, loves the Lord. Sits on the front row. Faithful, faithful in soul winning, faithful in giving, faithful in our choir. And we thank the Lord for him. I'm glad he's with me. We've had a wonderful time. Has a beautiful voice that God is using for the Lord. I want you to listen to the words of this song. The song says, every day I'm amazed that God would spend the day with me. I think we think God owes us something. I hope we'll never quit living in fascination that a holy God wants to fool and unholy us. So would you listen to the words as he sings? There's a place 
that only God can fill. I find amazing grace when I'm found within His will and His reserved sacred place where we can spend the day and He's waiting there for me inviting me to stay and every day I'm amazed that God would spend the day with me I'm overwhelmed by His ways That He would feel such love for me To Him I'm worth saving And my heart is craving To know Him in His righteousness Stand his ways every day in every way I'm amazed in God's heart there's a place that only I can feel covers my disgrace with the blood that Jesus spilled and he invites me to a place where we can spend the day and he's waiting there for me inviting me to stay saving and my heart is craving to know him in his righteousness and understand his ways now every day
at the gate of heaven waiting to go in and he wondered how this holy place could take a man like him with shouts of great rejoicing and with music then they came of the angels standing by him he asked what could be
Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness. Because of mine enemies, make thy way straight before my face. Let the church say amen. amen. Our Father, I pray, God, tonight that you'd help me as your vessel. Yes. Cleanse me of sin. Empty me of self. And fill me with your spirit. Yes. Between last night and tonight, there have been more spiritual battles raging. But I'm glad I'm on the winning side. Yes. Now, I pray, God, tonight that you would help me to lean completely on you and not on my own understanding. In all my ways might I acknowledge you, knowing that you will direct my path. I pray that you'll bind the forces of Satan, put a hedge of protection about this place, that in no way you'd hinder the work of the Holy Ghost of God. I pray for unction to function tonight, and I pray that you'll use me, and then when all is said and done, we leave here not seeing a man, but seeing the master. And I pray that you'll help us watch over my precious wife and my children while I'm gone. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. We established a scene last night of King David trying to live for God, trying to serve God, trying to honor God, trying to walk with God, trying to worship God. And by the way, you ought to be trying to do the same thing. But he learned that living for God not only assembled around him people that looked up to him, but it also amassed around him people that looked down at him. He found himself the center of people's conflict. He found himself the target of people's attack. It seemed the longer he lived, the more enemies he had. Anybody witness that tonight? It seemed the more he tried to do right, the more others tried to do him wrong. He found himself surrounded by enemies, often in war, uh, perpetually, perpetually at conflict. And because of the enemies that surrounded him, he found himself in Psalm 5 crying out to Almighty God for absolute unparalleled leadership. Verse number eight, lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness. Can I say to you tonight that our world is not lacking leadership. It's lacking good leadership. We're not missing people that are leading people. We're just missing people that are leading people the right way. And David began to realize that the arm of flesh will fail. Men are just human beings and the best of us are susceptible to falling. But there's a God who never changes. There's a God who has no impurity. There's a God who is without sin. There is a God who's altogether lovely. There's a God who's the apex of holiness and he will never fail. So David said, I've got these enemies around me. I've got these haters surrounding me. I've got these that mock God. They laugh at God. They hate God. They don't believe God. And because of that, God, I don't want to fail. I don't want to falter. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to have a misstep. I don't want to make a mistake. So, God, I'm looking to you and I'm saying in your profound mind, in your omniscient understanding, in your omnipotent character in your omnipresent self oh God bring your will bring your mind bring your guidance bring your leadership bring your direction down in my path in my face so that when I go I go where you're leading I believe it's where we are today I believe we're we're living in perilous times. I said last night, I've never enjoyed serving God any more than I do right now, and yet I've never felt under more pressure than I am right now. To pastor in the 21st century is an enormous amount of pressure. Maybe some pastors don't acknowledge the pressure because they don't know what they're doing. And I'm not saying, I mean, they're not skilled because none of us really know what we're doing were it not for the grace of God. 
But I listen to me. I still tremble every Saturday night at the prospect of meeting the people of God in the place where their spiritual nourishment is contingent upon my willingness to receive what God has for me. Too many men are mounting a pulpit with some well-sounding sermon instead of a message from Almighty God. The aisles and the pews are not packed tonight because people had nothing else to do. They're sitting in the building tonight because out there there's a devil. There's a job with wickedness. There are schools with impurity. There's a government that seems to have lost their mind and they're standing here tonight not to hear a sermon out of a briefcase but a wire from Almighty God. And so I stand here tonight and I say God don't let me wow the crowd or entertain the audience or just make people laugh. I need Almighty God to make his way straight before my face. Every husband should be looking for leadership. Every wife should be looking for leadership. Listen to me, ma'am. If you think you're going to find out how to be a good wife by turning the television on, good luck. Sir, if you think you're going to be a good husband by working out every morning in the gym alone, good luck. Kids, if you think you're going to be good kids by mocking them kids on Nickelodeon, good luck. If you think you're going to manage to keep your purity by pumping that rap music in your mind, good luck. If you think just because you go to independent fundamental Baptist church that you'll never go astray, good luck. There's nothing the world can give you that will secure your future for eternity. But there's a God who put the stars in place. There's a God who cannot fail. There's a God who always was there's a God who always will be and he can and he will and he must lead me uh, I'm not sure some people want it hmm. <laughs> some of us will never arrive at Psalm 5 because we're so afraid that the leadership of God will invade our agenda <laughs> that's why some people can't can't read the Bible without the TV on. They, they can't pray without uh, uh, playing on their phone. They can't sit in church without being intentionally distracted. They're way too nervous as to what God might say. Yeah. Not David. David said, I'm, I'm so scared of trying to walk without God saying something. And so he began with a desperate plea. God, I'm crying to you. God, I'm dialing your number. Would you pick up? Did you dial God this morning? Did you dial God this morning? Do you even know God's number? Does God know your number? Oh, I'm telling you what David said. I'm dialing, but I need an answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you on speed dial, but God, I need you to pick up. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Aren't you glad that God is still in the answering business? Jesus is on the main line. Call him up and tell him what you want. I'm afraid that teenagers, they know the songs, they know the games, they know the styles, they know the fans, but they don't know how to get through to God his desperate plea if you would was upgirded by his divine persuasion there was some things about God he believed and knew had not changed the holy displeasure of God he knew that God still had no pleasure in wickedness amen and I said last night, stuff God hated, he still hates. And li listen, you'll never get leadership from God when you're trying to condone sin that God does not condone. You'll never get leadership from God when you let the world do your thinking for you. Listen to me, you'll never get leadership from God when political correctness trumps biblical correctness. You'll never get leadership from God when shifting paradigms will shift your convictions. You'll never get leadership from God when Hollywood will tell you how to think, when a mannequin will tell you how to dress, when a rapper will tell you how to talk to your mama, come on now, when a politician will tell you how to think. You'll never get leadership from God until you stand on your persuasion that God hates sin. It's heavenly disgust. Heavenly. 
disgust. Yes. Foolish in our stand in our sight. I hate us, the workers of iniquity. They're happening destruction. He will destroy them. Number three, we saw last night, David had a distinct plan. Now listen, I'm afraid sometimes that we are so busy trying to get God to do what he can do that we don't spend any time doing what we can do. I'm always amazed that when Jesus arrived at the scene where Lazarus had died, and, and there those mourners were grieving the loss of this friend of Jesus. His family members could not believe he had died. They were really there having a funeral. Come on, right. For four days he'd been dead, wrapped up in his grave clothes, and he stank. That's right. That's what he said. Look, listen, they, 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 they were looking for the resurrection in an event, and the truth of the matter is the resurrection showed up in a person. Y'all looking for something to happen. Jesus said, you don't need to look for something until you see somebody. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I'm telling you what, he was warming up for a miracle. But before he did what only he could do, he said to them, move the stone. Now y'all can't get that man to get out that grave, but I'll tell you what you can do. You can move that stone. And I'm telling you, you can't do the impossible, but you better learn how to do the possible. Amen. Amen. And David said, I'll tell you, I can't choose what everybody else does, but I can choose what I do. I will approach his presence. I will come into the house in the multitude of, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. Aren't you glad in 2019 we can still approach the presence of God? And by the way, there are a lot of churches that have services every week and never welcome the presence of God. Too many churches mirror funeral homes. God help us. And by the way, the presence of God is not merely mirrored by noise and emotion. Otherwise, every football stadium in America has the presence of God. Some people shout their lungs out and God never shows up. I'll tell you how you know God's there. Not by the volume in the crowd, but by the holiness in the atmosphere. When God shows up, people can't do what they want to do. I'll approach his presence through his abundant provision. His mercy is my grounds for approaching him with an awestruck awestruck perspective. I will worship in fear. Thank God for the fear of God. Where have we lost our respect for God? What man of man is this, they said, for he commandeth even the wind and the water, and they obey him. Does God amaze you? Does God astonish you? Does God wow you? Does God cause you to go, I've never seen it like that? before does God cause you to go nobody else has ever done that before we ought to be living in anticipation of God wondering what he's going to do next David said when I got into the presence of God there was fear that came over me I don't care how big your church is how famous your pastor is or how good your choir is when the presence of God shows up you ought to be in reverence and in fear of almighty God no question about it and his absolute praise, I will worship. Yes, sir. What has happened to worship? Wow. Now we got people that call it praise and worship and it ain't worship. Yes, and I'm not saying that it's not for everybody. I'm just simply saying just because you say you're worshiping doesn't mean you're worshiping. Yes, just like just because you park in a spot that says doctor don't make you one. Yes, you, got to, you got to put in the time. Yes, Somebody help me preach. Yes, I, I, I tell you what, we need some worshipers. Notice number four, if you will, definite persecutors. David begins to highlight some things about them. Tell us about your enemies, David. They lack character. No faithfulness in their mouth. Where has America descended when the stuff that comes out of people's mouths, people don't even blink at anymore. There was a day when a child of God heard a cuss word, they gasped. Don't get quiet on me. You'll make me think you cuss. That's right. Preach on. That's good. There was a day when our little girls still knew what innocence was. Somebody help me preach. Amen. 
There was a day when people did stuff, but they didn't do it in the house of God. There was a day you couldn't get a dirty joke out of a preacher. I said out of a preacher. There was a day when the children of God didn't sound like the world. There was a day when secular vernacular was not apparent in the life of Christians. But now people have faithless mouths. They have faulty motives. Notice what he said. Not only is their mouth faithless, but their inward part is wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. He said, I'm living around people who not only do the wrong thing, but they do the wrong thing on purpose. They have a fumy makeup about them. They, they stink. They smell like corpse. And they have a flattering manner about them. They know how to kiss up, but they're not real. They said, this is where we are. By the way, this stuff's crept right into the church. Amen, young people. It's, it's a, I, I wonder why some of these kids don't want to serve God because they have seen so much hypocrisy. I said so much hypocrisy. A, a, amen. Amen. I, I mean, there, there was a day and age you, could, you wouldn't catch people stand on church property smoking. There was a day people pull up to the church, they wouldn't blast that, that, that worldly music. Come on. There, there, there was a day when a, when a child of God left church, they left church, but they didn't leave their Christianity at church. Amen. Uh, there was a day and age where you could hear somebody talk one way on Sunday and they talk the same way on Monday, but he said there's a flattering manner about these folks. They talk like they love God, but they don't really love God. And nowadays, they will leave the choir off shouting for Jesus, sit down in the pew and post nonsense on Facebook in the same church. No shame. No shame. They're just, they're just flatterers. They lack character. So David said, I have a longing cry about them. God, I'm asking you to do something. Destroy thou them. God, I'm asking you to have a sovereign dealing with them. God, destroy them. You know what he's saying, God? I'm not asking you to kill people. I'm asking you to kill wickedness. Where is the hungering cry of the child of God in 2019? Said God, get our country back to you. Get sin out of our schools. Get sin out of my generation. Keep that hip hop music from destroying their minds. Keep that immorality from stealing their future. Keep that lying devil from annihilating their testimony. Oh God, wipe out evil. Sovereign dealings. Then he says, self-destruction, God. Not only wipe them out of their wickedness, but God, let them fall by their own counsels. Let everybody that mocks Christianity, let them trip up themselves. <laughs> Amen. He said, God, I want a supreme discharge from you. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgression. I'm telling you what I'm begging God to evict sin. Yes, sir. Amen. You know why I'm begging him? Because I can't do it. Come on. I, I, listen, I've tried it. Listen, yeah. listen. You know how I've learned, preacher? Just because I preach louder doesn't mean they're going to do it. You say you sound pretty loud. Yeah, I've done it so long, I don't even know how to stop. But louder preaching doesn't make you a better Christian. And softer preaching doesn't make you a weak one. Come on, come on now. Just because you got a ramped up church service doesn't mean you're going to leave there holy. So somebody help me preach. You're going to be holy because you decide to be holy. We're trying to get everybody to live for God. They haven't died with God yet. Come on now. Paul said, I'm crucified. Nevertheless, I live. You can't live till you die. Amen. 
and you can't die until you decide you're not on the throne. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's what David said. I want you to run them out of here. God, if there are people in the church that don't want to do right, get that mess out of the church. Get that mess out of our home. Get that mess out of our schools. Get that mess out of our families. God, we're trying to do right. They're shameful disobedience. Here's why they act like this, God. They have rebelled against thee. Sometimes as a pastor, you find yourself trying to wrap your head around how people can do what they do. Well, they do what they do because they've turned against God. Listen to me, teenagers. You're living in a world that's living in a way that's entirely contrary to the Word of God. I'm asking you how that settles with you. The New Testament tells us that Lot stayed in it, but his soul was vexed. You know what that means? That means he had to hit the mute button on his soul every day in order to keep doing what they were doing. And the New Testament tells us you hit mute long enough, eventually your conscience gets seared. It doesn't say mute, but you know what I'm saying. And I'm afraid that Christian kids have hit mute so long on the voice of God that stuff doesn't bother them anymore. God, help us. You cannot train yourself to hate sin. You fall in love with Jesus and it'll come with the package. The closer you get to God, the further you get from the world. The more you walk with Jesus, the more you won't stand the devil. The more you get into this Bible, the more you'll spot stuff that's contrary to it. You don't need to spend the next four years studying Calvinism. You need to spend the next four years studying the book of Romans. And when Calvinism comes around, you'll know it's no good. Fall in love with the Lord. I'm closing. Number number five. He ends with a detailed petition. God, I got a sincere request. I got a sincere request about consecrated people. Does it really pay to serve God? We know the answer biblically, but practically some people are going, not really. Some kids are going, I've seen my parents suffer. It's not worth it. I've lost my good friends. It's not worth it. I'm missing playtime on my ball team. It's not worth it. I'm in a school with much fewer scouts. It's not worth it. I got all these rules in my life. It's not worth it. I can't date anybody I want to date. It's not worth it. I'm telling you, that's the biggest lie ever hatched out of hell. The devil wants you to think that New Testament Christianity will jip you. It will take advantage of you. It will manipulate you. It will give you the short end of the stick. Have you read your Bible? You know who's going to manipulate you? The thief. He comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But my Savior came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus doesn't want to steal your life. He wants to give you life. Yeah, he does. Absolutely. So his sincere request is involving consecrated people. Look at it, would you? And let's wrap up these last two verses. They put their trust in thee. Does it pay to trust him? Does it pay to trust him? Yes, see, see, we're raising kids that, that uh, they, they, they know about length of skirts and height of blouses, but they've never learned how to trust God. Come on. That's right. And by the way, in case, you, in case you're confused, I'm for both of those. But that won't keep you holy. Learn how to trust him. Yeah, yeah, amen. amen. I, mean, I mean, David couldn't get up in front of Goliath and say, listen, I'm going to play the harp and you're going to fall down. No, no, no. <laughs> and, and, and just because you sing in the youth choir doesn't mean the devil's going to run from you. Right. You better have more than a little song you done worked up. 
You better have a testimony about that lion that tried to mess with you and you trusted God. About that bear that tried to mess with you and you trusted God. And you better tell Goliath you're going to whip him the same way you whipped everything else through the power of God that all the earth may know that there's a God in heaven. He said, let those that trust you, they are dependent Christians. And because they are dependent Christians, they are defended Christians. He said, thou defendest them. I'm glad that we when you live for God, he fights your battles. I'm glad that when you live for God, he stands in front of you. I'm glad when you live for God, the devil can't destroy you. I'm glad when you live for God, the world can't devour you. I'm glad when you live for God, the trends can't smother you. I'm glad when you live for God, your friends can't change you. I'm glad when you live for God, God will defend you. I've learned anything in the ministry over the years. He's a good defender. Oh, my soul. They are dependent people. They are defended people. They are devoted people. Are you listening to me? They're dependent convictions. Their defended character brings with it a devoted compulsion. Notice he says, they love thy name. We, we got to get back to really thinking about what we sing when we say, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Why do you love him? Because when I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained with sin, seeking to rise no more, that the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me now safe am I you know why I love him because when there was no rose red enough there was no lamb white enough there was no man good enough that God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons you know why I love him because he looked beyond my fault and he saw my need you know why I love him that God who was rich for my sake became poor that we through his grace might become rich. You know why I love him? Because he, speaking of the Father, hath made him, speaking of the sin, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I love him because he loved me. But, 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 does it, does it really pay to be consecrated people? Well, notice what David said. They're consecrated people who enjoy a consequential pleasure. Verse 11, they trust. They're defended. They love. Now look at the result. Verse 11, they rejoice. They shout for joy. They're joyful in thee. Now, now listen, listen. I, I'm not having a hard time finding people to go to church, but I'm having a hard time finding people to go to joy. Yes, sir. Come on, you're right. You're right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes, sir. I mean, I can find teenagers in churches everywhere. I'm not, listen, I'm not contending that our churches have no teenagers in them anymore. Yes, right. I'm just telling you that most of them in the church don't want to be there. That's right. You're right, brother. They don't have no joy. And, and listen, listen, and, and here's what they tell you. Well, it's not that we don't have joy. It's just that we're not expressive. And then you take them out of an auditorium and you put a remote control and an Xbox in front of them. And all of a sudden, Mr. Non-Expressive goes from being Simba to Mufasa. You understand what I'm saying? Here's the problem. Joy can never be humanly manufactured. Now, you leave out here tonight, you go up the road to Walmart, and I'm going to tell you, if you want food, they got it. If you want clothes, they got it. If you want electronics, they got it. If you need toiletries, they got it. If you need some drink, they got it. They got McDonald's in there. I mean, I don't like my wife going into Walmart because they got too much stuff in there. And she's always going to be in there longer than she intended because on the way to the grocery, she's going to pass the clothes. And on the way to the clothes, she's going to pass the toiletries. And on the way to the toiletries, she's going to pass the jewelry. And on the way to the jewelry, she's going to pass the electronics. And on the way out the door, I'm going to feel my pockets going sour. You understand what I'm saying? I'm simply saying everybody likes Walmart because it's your one-stop shop. But I'm here to tell you, you can walk up 
up the aisles of every Walmart in America and abroad and you'll never find joy on the aisles. You'll never find joy on the aisles. They sell everything but they can't sell that because they can't manufacture that because it's not made in China or made in America. It's made in heaven. Now here's what David said. When you trust God, when you love God, when you're defended by God, you don't need a song, you don't need a drum, you don't need a music director, you don't need a choir, you don't need a church service. There's just something about living for God that puts joy in your soul and all the demons in hell and the runs run around earth can't steal your joy. Oh yeah, it pays. It pays to be devoted. It pays to be dependent. It pays to be defended. It'll give you a joyful shout. <laughs> you show me a teenager walking with God. And this, listen, here we do, trying to, we try to train them how to shout. Some pastors are going to, going to orchestrate shouting training in the church. I've been at church, some churches where the pastor said, if you ain't standing up right now and making some noise, you ain't right with God. And half of them standing up devils. Somebody say, you got a problem with raising hands in church? Not at all, as long as they're holy hands. If they ain't holy, keep them down. It's not American Idol. This is the church of the living God. We ain't no hey and ho. You're trying to serve God. But you, you, we, I, I, I've known men trying try to get these teenagers to raise your hand up and raise your hand. And they just, some of them got the hand up and don't know why they put it up. Yeah, and they take that same hand yes, and they leave church and they click on that wicked site. Yes, same hand. Yes, same hand. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Click. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. Channel. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. Post. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. Tweet. Yes, Come on now. Yes, we can't teach people how to shout. We teach them how to walk with God and they will shout. They may not scream. They may not clap their hand. They may not wave a hanky. They may not run around the church, but you'll be able to tell they're glad to serve God. They're glad to live for God. Nobody makes them do it. They're glad they do it. Yeah, no question. A joyful shout and a joyous sentiment. Now, last point. And I'm finished. I'm never finished, but I'm going to quit. <laughs> he had a sincere request, but he closed, if you would, this detailed petition with a stabilizing reassurance. Huh. Look at what he said. For thou, Lord, wilt bless. Ooh. <laughs> I, I run into people all the time. Now, I'm probably going to offend somebody, but the good news is that I'm going home tonight. <laughs> so you can talk about me for the next five hours. I'll be in the car thinking about what you're saying. Bless him, Lord. There are some people in, a, in America whose Christianity has turned sour because they are so disillusioned by what is happening in politics. They, they, listen, listen, listen. They can't even praise Jesus in church because they're so worried about what they saw on Fox or CNN. Now, I'm not trying to get in your business. I'm trying to get all up in your business. And I'm trying to tell you I don't get my joy from Fox, I don't get my joy from CNN, I don't get my joy from MSNBC. CBS, NBC, come on now. I don't get my joy from none of them. I don't get my joy from who's in the White House. I don't get my joy from who's in Congress. I don't get my joy from who's in the House of Representatives. I get my joy from who's sitting on the throne, who rules and who reigns. And some of you ought to quit watching news if it depress you and start reading your Bible. And I watch the news every day, but they ain't going to run me because I done read this every day. 
And, and when the news changed, the Bible said, forever thy word is settled in heaven and in earth. So some people just struggling. If, if, if this person wins, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive? What's going to happen to preaching? And, and what are we going to do? What about the gospel? And what about serving God? And, and if something doesn't happen on this day at the polls, Christianity is all gone. You sound like the disciples in the room singing the blues. Could I tell you, I don't care what the government does for me. I'm going to be okay. Because like the psalmist said I've been young and now I'm old but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed of begging bread if the government shuts down God's still good if the economy plummets God's still good if the stock market crashes God's still good because I stand resolute on this sure assurance that my God will bless amen the extended blessings of God. Look at the verse. But there's also some eligible behavior, eligible behavior for blessings. I hear people say all the time. You say, how you doing? Blessed. How you doing? Blessed. And some of them ain't blessed. Not like they think they are. Because the verse said, thou wilt bless. But don't forget the next two words. The righteous. You can't live like the devil. Blast. <laughs> Drowning in carnality. Blast. <laughs> Just because you say the catchphrase don't mean you caught it. <laughs> I've learned over the years, God bless righteous people. I said, God bless righteous people. He, he looks out for righteous people. He favors righteous people. He takes care of righteous people. The rich man died and went to hell. Lazarus died and went to heaven. God blesses righteous people. Amen. Extended blessings. Eligible, eligible behavior. And then I close with this encircling boundary. With favor. Wilt thou compass him? As with a shield. Now remember, he's under attack. God, I need leadership. I need leadership, God. They're shooting arrows. They're aiming weapons. They're launching attack. You're serving God and you don't feel like you're under attack. You ain't serving hard enough. Like Gomer Powell said, Shazam. Give God your best. You'll feel the attack. God, I, I, I need to be shielded. But here's a stabilizing assurance. He said, God, God has compassed me about with his shield. And the amazing thing of this passage is, you know what David uses to describe God's shield? Favor. Now, I know what you're thinking. God, I'm under attack by these wicked people. God, bring out a sword. God, bring out the stealth bomb from heaven. Get Gabriel and Michael and line them up with semi-automatics and just let them aim. Don't you feel like that sometimes? Don't you wish God would send one of them strong angels like he did for Hezekiah and them? Down to your school, down to your job. Some of you pastors saying, down to my church. <laughs> Get him! <laughs> and David said, I'm finding out that God often shields me not with weapons of attack, but with blessings. I'm surrounded. Now, some of you kids are under the most grave spiritual attack that you've ever faced. You're living in a generation that most of us never thought you would live in. 
and you're absolutely clueless as to how you're going to manage to make it through that war zone without getting hit. You're looking for a bomb, an arrow, a gun, a weapon, a sword, or at least a bodyguard. And I want to draw you to Psalm 5 and tell you, stop looking for weapons. God has surrounded you with something way better than weapons. It is his favor. And the next time you feel like the devil's going to destroy you and the world is going to annihilate you and evil is going to drown you look in front of you God's blessed you with a godly family with a good church with a loving home with a free country with the Holy Ghost of God with an alive Bible with peace with joy unspeakable and full of glory you know what I'm finding out the devil can't hit me I am surrounded by favor Sometimes we are so busy looking out the window for God to authorize the smackdown that right in the bedroom with us, he's given us favor. You don't have to fail. You don't need no big, big way out dose of abracadabra from God to live for God. You're in a good church. Come on, come on. You, you, got, you got a King James Bible. Come on, yes. You got a mom and dad. You got a preacher that'll preach what God tells him. Yes, sir. You got a country that will take the Bible out of your school but leave you in it with a Bible. Right. Go figure. Yeah. Right. We're blessed. Amen. God, I'm surrounded and I feel the heat. I don't want to fail the people that are looking up to me because they are following me as I follow you. But God, there's a whole nother dynamic of pressure. I don't want to fail while the people are looking down at me. Because they've already doubted you, God. And my failure will only give them more ammunition for their fallacy. The next Christian kid that gets pregnant the next godly couple that gets divorced. Yeah. The next man of God that falls into moral failure. Right. The enemies of God go. That's exactly what we yeah. thought. We knew he wasn't real. We knew the Bible wasn't capable. We knew the spirit couldn't keep you right. We knew the pressure was too big for you. David said, I know they're watching me. And because of that, God, here's what I'm asking. Make thy way straight before my face. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. But the great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That means that God sent His Son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God Himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you are lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. As the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? When I ask you, would you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? 
You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.